All right, guys, I want to know the craziest situation that you guys have ever gotten yourselves into together. Okay, uh, Tom's going to know where this is going on real quick. It's uh, our freshman year of college, I think. Yeah, no, no, uh, it's, our, it's our sophomore year. But Tom and I become friends freshman year of college. We've known each other about 12 years now. A friend of mine uh, who I'd known since high school convinces me. I had never been before. He's like, you've got to go to New York Comic Con. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, you know what? I like comics. I like stuff. I'll go. I even convince, uh, you know, my, my father to go. And then I'm mentioning to Tom, uh, one day in class, I'm like, I'm going to go to New York Comic Con this year. And Tom pulls out his laptop, looks it up and he goes, oh shit, they're doing a panel for the new Friday the 13th. And, uh, what's his face? What's his name, Tom? I'm blanking on it now. Jared Padalecki. Jared Padalecki from Supernatural is going to be there. And Tom loved Supernatural. So Tom buys a ticket to Comic-Con solely for the purpose of meeting Jared Padalecki, right? Yep. Now, Tom, uh, why don't you take this part of your experience, Jared Padalecki, and then I'll, I'll follow it up. So day of, you go to, you know, I go to the panel. I see the footage from Friday the 13th, from Watchmen, from Terminator Salvation. And I'm excited, and then it's the 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 meet and greet. The you know you can get the autograph for an hour at a certain time. I think it was like noon because it was early in the day. And uh, I go to the I go to, I go to where it's supposed to be. I asked uh, somebody working there, I'm like, oh, is this the line for uh, Friday the 13th? And they go, yeah. And I'm on line with a bunch of people, mainly girls, because they're all there for Jared Padalecki. Because apparently, uh, this was the first time I found out uh, girls love Supernatural, and uh, waiting on line. The line's not moving, but I'm seeing people go up and, you know, I see the, the cast there and I see people getting their shit signed and I'm like, okay, you know, it, there's no delay, whatever, you know, whatever, we're not moving. But then an hour passes, we haven't moved and I am getting annoyed. And then I see the cast of Friday the 13th get up and leave. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I find someone walking about who is one of the people that work at Comic Con. I go, "Excuse me, is was this is this the line for the Friday Thirteenth?" And they go, "No, I don't know what this is for." And you and you see all of the girls around me get really sad and upset. And I go, "What the fuck do you mean this wasn't the line? One of you fucking assholes said this was the line, so I waited here for a fucking hour." And they're like, "I don't know. I'm sorry." I'm like, "Fuck you!" I start screaming at them, and I'm fucking pissed off. And then I just leave. I go home. I take the Long Island Railroad 45 minutes back to Long Island. Mike texts me as I'm on the train 20 okay, minutes. Yeah. He's like, where are you? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going home. I'm fucking pissed off. I'm going home. Meanwhile, I'm extra thrown by this. Uh, that Tom didn't get to meet him because I could give a shit about Supernatural uh, or the new Friday the 13th. But apparently while all this was going on, I had stopped into one of the men's rooms at the Jacob Javits Center. And uh, whilst I was at a urinal, a very tall, long-haired gentleman walks, stands next to me. And I happened to notice, because I would not have known otherwise, that his name tag around his neck says, Jared Padalecki, guest. And I just looked up at him and uh, went, oh, you're Jared Padalecki. He goes, yeah. Went, all right. Very quick exchange. And we left. The minute Ed and Tom's like, I've gone home. This is bullshit. I didn't get to meet him. I was like, oh, yeah, I just, I just met him. He seems like a nice guy. <laughs> just Tom was furious for the next couple days about that, I think. Next week. Yeah, I'm still mad. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, but sometimes movies are. We're talking 1959 Some Like It Hot here on You're Missing Out with special guest Zainab Akande. Our guest today is a New York City social media editor and former freelance and TV reporter. Zainab Akande joins us to talk about the film Some Like It Hot. Zainab, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you also noted we can just call you Z, but then I'm worried that our listeners might confuse you with a 1969 Best Picture nominated Greek film about political assassinations. So. <laughs> You know, that constant mix up. And it's important that we talk about a film about political anxiety and chaos, because just to let our listeners know right off the bat, in case uh, all of us seem on edge, you're hearing this in February, but uh, we are recording this on November 5th, which, uh, as a little historical note, we don't know who's president yet. I mean, have we known for the last four years? <laughs> but I mean, right <laughs> now, just so our listeners know, they are still counting states. 
We have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, we ironically, by this point, you will have already heard our very nervous Mr. Smith goes to Washington episode about the same topic. So our list, our listeners have been having a lot of fun uh, hindsight uh, laughing at our expense by now, I assume. But to take our mind off of it, we are here to talk about drag. Yeah. One of the most uh, revered comedies in cinema history. One of the only comedies in the inaugural year of the registry. You know, there were there were a couple, uh, but you know, one of the only comedies in the first year of the registry. And also, as a fun little sort of full circle, our first episode was on Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard. This is the second Billy Wilder film inducted in the inaugural year. Uh, we are talking about Some Like It Hot. Uh, now, Zina, why? I, I remember that we I had sent you uh, a couple of a couple of the films, or I will admit, uh, you were sent by proxy because uh, my significant other uh, informed me that you used to write about film, which we had met each other several times, had never come up, and I had absolutely no idea. That sounds <laughs> which is... very much like a thing Bella would do. <laughs> it was one of those things where I was just like sitting there one day lamenting. I'm like. Oh man, I got you know. I I I want to make sure we get you know some good guests on there. And and she turns around, and she goes, "Well, I I I I think Zaynab used to cover film festivals and all." And I went, oh, "Holy cow!" And then immediately <laughs> was like, "Send her this list." And like it was one of those you know true truly like one of those old screwball comedy things where it's like, if only we had the key. Oh, I've had the key the whole time, Abbott. You just never asked. Uh, you know that kind of a thing. So we sent you over the list, and immediately you were like, "This is this is the one I want to do. I want some like it hot." So out of all the films, what was it about Some Like It Hot that made you made you pick that one? Well, I mean, Marilyn Monroe, she's just such a great figure, almost like mythical and legendary. And I'm just kind of like obsessed with her and like everything she does. So immediately I was like, this is a movie. And I had watched it a very long time ago, um, probably when I was a kid. And I remembered enjoying it. But obviously when you watch something when you're younger, there's so much you don't get about it. Um, you know, and rewatching it as an adult, which I watched it um, a couple of times for this podcast. And I'm like, wow, a lot of the um, naughty jokes went over my head for one. <laughs> we, we found that a couple of times at the films we've done here of the stuff that is a lot more uh, raunchy than anybody uh, expects. So let's get a little bit, if it's OK, let's give the listeners a little bit of background on you and your experience with film and, and, and writing about film in particular, you know, what, where, how, you, how you come at cinema. Sure. Um, so I guess to start, I studied at the CUNY uh, Graduate School of Journalism, although they renamed it. So I believe it's the Craig Newmark uh, School of Journalism now. And there I actually specialized in arts and culture reporting. Um, I immediately went to grad school after undergrad, kind of knowing that I wanted to be in journalism and knowing that I wanted to do entertainment journalism in particular. So um, that, you know, kind of spearheaded me to realized that, you know, if I want to do that, um, I'm either going to go to LA or New York. And um, given that my family's from New York, I was born in New York, I was just like, New York it is. So applied to schools there, got into, um, you know, the graduate program. And um, yeah, I had, I had such a great experience just um, sort of, you know, really digging into film and television reporting. And it was, there was kind of more to it than I, you know, kind of realized, you know, starting out. Um, I had a great instructor at the school, um, Janice Simpson, and she um, especially was great at kind of like teaching about sort of like money and the arts in particular, which was kind of felt like an economics class. And I just was like, I felt like I learned so much. And um, from there, I just had, you know, kind of continued on that route, um, was able to uh, write a while for IndieWire, um, did some writing for like Bustle and um, did some writing for the MPAA's uh, website. Um, so kind of like a variety of publications. And yeah, that's about it. So you were the you, you were the one at the MPAA. So your your job, I'm assuming, was just to be the person that decides whether you describe it as nudity or brief nudity in the uh, in the ratings. Uh, oh, of little, course. Little box. Of na na naturally. <laughs> it is that that is one of those things that always gets me when they've got like when they have like violence or graphic violence extremely graphic violence you do kind of wonder like do they have a specific sheet where they're just sitting down and like there's only so many heads that are allowed to explode before it becomes I, extremely graphic violence. I, I don't think there's a, that much of a, a a sheet of hard and fast rules mainly just because you'll hear stories of like james wan submitting the conjuring or scott derrickson submitting sinister and they'll be like okay this is a rated r and like 
we shot it as a PG-13. What what can we do to edit it to not be annoying? Like nothing. This little this movie's literally too scary. You're assholes for even making it. It's a rated R. And you're just like, well, fuck. <laughs> well, was I? I was I was just listening to not to get us too off track. I was just listening to um, Brian De Palma uh, talking with Alec Baldwin on this podcast, and De Palma was talking about I think it was either Scarface or Carlito's Way, but that they kept sending his cuts to the MPAA. They kept saying it's too violent. You have to cut this. It's too violent. So he kept making cuts. Kept making cuts, and they're like, it's still too violent. It's still too violent. So finally, he just goes. Well, at this point, I'm not going to cut anymore. I don't care. And they went, and the studio went, well, do you want to just release the cut you have? He goes, no, go back to the original. If I'm going to get, like, a, a hard R on this thing, let's just go all the way with it. Let's just make it as bloody and violent as we can. Probably Scarface. Probably. I mean, but there's plenty of stories of filmmakers saying, yeah, we knew we were going to try to trick the MPAA, so we just filmed violence that we didn't even want in the movie. So they'd be like, oh, cut that and cut that and not even look at the shit we really wanted to get in. So... You know, we're dealing with scholars here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I we don't mean. To, well, I'm not bashing your former employers. Name to be clear, none of us are. It's just a confusing. Thing. <laughs> and interestingly enough, as we will get into with this, uh, Billy Wilder ran into a, a number of problems uh, with censorship and attempted censorship with this film. So as we get into talking about some like it hot, I am going to start by reading the registry's statement as to why they chose the film. One of director Billy Wilder's best-loved films, thanks to breakneck pacing, a touch of cynicism, and gender-bending and gender-celebrating jokes galore, Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis are two musicians who disguise themselves as members of an all-girl orchestra in order to escape from gangster George Raft after the pair of musicians witness a mob hit. Marilyn Monroe is the singing star of the band who dreams of marrying a bookish millionaire instead of the bums who always leave her with the fuzzy end of the lollipop. Some Like It Hot marked the first of seven films that Lemon would make with Wilder between 1959 and 1981, including The Apartment, which is also on the registry. With Pat O'Brien, Nehemia Persoff, and Joe E. Brown, who gets one of the best punchlines in American cinema. Now I do, if it's okay, want to read one more quote describing Some Like It Hot. A song about thug domination, sharing a name with the Marilyn Monroe movie Some Like It Hot, where two dudes cross-dressed to get booty and escape the mob. That second statement, of course, comes from the notes on the website Genius regarding the Jay-Z song It's Hot, Some Like It Hot off of Volume 3. I felt like those were two different synopses of the film that I thought were equally important. I, I mean, sure. I mean, <laughs> it's, al it's always good to know Mike is looking at rap lyrics. <laughs> Uh, you you know um, me, classic. Yes. Yeah, I know. So I just I feel like I need to just start this off with this movie. Absolutely, should not be good. <laughs> I yeah, I agree because there is literally no other movie about men dressing as women to like trick or get out of something or get like like bosom buddies or whatever or like um sorority boys or so like this is the f like the only time it has ever worked and not only does I... it work it's one of the best written just movies ever it's it's like this movie is nonsense i will give you a little bit of pushback on that only to argue i think tootsie as well has to go in that category tootsie okay it <laughs> took them about 40 years for them to get to something that's like not a knock against Tootsie, but half as good as some yeah, like no, it hot. I, I agree. I agree there. And even then, it's like this movie kind of knows it's silly because yeah. they blatantly have to have someone else do Tony Curtis's voice. No, I think is that. No, I think that's him. That is not him. No, they had to use um, another okay. uh, woman's voice and blend it together because he had trouble. Um, oh, so it's literally, literally his voice. High tone. Okay. No, yeah. he literally couldn't get his voice to any sort of register that could even possibly yeah. be like a, a female voice. Because have you heard Tony Curtis speak? Not only have I heard him speak, uh, watching the special features in the Criterion, they have like an interview with him from like 1981 where somehow his voice has dropped 17 more octaves than it already was. Oh, that's what happens when you drink and smoke like <laughs> a maniac in 1940s and 50s Hollywood. It, they have some documentary on the Criterion, not to get us too off track at the start, but it just made me laugh, that there was a moment that truly felt like the, the Rick James Chappelle show sketch, because everybody is talking. Lemon, Wilder, um, 
IAL Diamond's widow are all talking about how Tony Curtis apparently hated working with Marilyn Monroe and couldn't stand her. And yeah. every one of them relays this story about how during the dailies, when they were watching the scene where Marilyn and Curtis kiss, uh, somebody made some remark and Tony Curtis stood up and went, it was like kissing Hitler. <laughs> and so a bunch of people relay the story and then they cut to 1981 Tony Curtis and it's just him going, I don't mean, I don't know I, why. Uh, I mean, it was a joke. Uh, I, I didn't mean it. I had no ill will toward it. I mean, it was just like, what else are you going to say? I thought it was funny to say, uh, like, kissing Hitler. I don't know why people got the idea I didn't like or I had no problem with it. God rest his soul. And it truly just reminded me of, like, I never stepped on his couch. Um, You know, very bizarre. But, no, I agree with you, Tom, to a degree. Like, they, this is certainly, you're right, this shouldn't work, especially because every step of the way, it keeps taking... It, it, it does the thing that a good screwball comedy does, which it keeps escalating well, because the, this the movie, circumstances. Like, the first 20 minutes of this movie is, like, a slightly comedic noir. Yeah. Where, like, the mob is in play, and he's not making them, like, goofy, like, oh, they're not threatening, even though their names are clearly him making fun of mafia figures. I mean, the guy who runs the uh, the funeral parlor, his name is just Mozzarella. Well, but do you I know mean, why? Do you know why his I, name is Mozzarella, too? Why is his name Mozzarella? Because in the gangster films of the 30s and the 40s, because that's one of the things that, uh, just so Zainab, so you know too, like one of the things that we kind of love with this show is when you're watching older films, there's certain jokes or certain references that kind of get lost to time. Mm -hmm. And especially we dealt with that with Chaplin, and we dealt with it with this, uh, as the commentary pointed out, uh, we don't really talk about it anymore, but to to, uh, sell somebody out to the cops was called cheesing on them which is partly where the whole rat term comes from. It's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. But the idea was like, if somebody was selling you out, they were cheesing on you. And that was a term that gets used in some of those old Warner gangster films. So by so, having Toothpick Charlie underneath the mozzarella sign, that's also a reference to, it's a joke of the name, but it's also a joke on the absurdity of the thing. But it's, so it's like, you got this mob story and you got him. It seems like it's just going to be like, a slightly com- like a comedic but like they might still get killed crime noir thing and then 20 minutes is just like no we're gonna dress up like women go down to what florida right yeah, florida. It's some- yeah they're gonna go down to florida and just live as women for a few weeks and nobody's gonna know and they're just gonna play music and you're just like this is so fucking weird and then the mob figures come back I mean, they do the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Yep. Yep. Like, literally just mowing people down with machine guns. Then at the end, these mob guys come back, and they get fucking massacred. So it's not like a case of, like, oh, they're like some Mickey Blue Eyes shit where it's just they're all, they're like mob in name only. It's like, no, these guys are going to fucking assassinate Jack Lemon and Tony Curtis if they catch up to them. It's like, if Scarface started, and then after they kill Rabanga in the, the Cuban camp, they get out and all of a sudden they're in Toontown. <laughs> but like, but like it does, but like the movie doesn't fall apart. You're just like, yes, this makes sense. It's, it's absolutely okay that Tony Montana is interacting with Wiley e. Coyote, which I would watch for the record. Um, but it's interesting you point that out because one thing I noticed watching this again is that why, I mean, look, we all know Billy Wilder is one of the greatest screenwriters. Uh, I mean, this is know, just the biggest, this is the best trick he ever pulled. Yeah. I, I, I think I like movies. There's a handful of movies I like more than this he made, but th- like like I said, this movie shouldn't work. It's absolute nonsense if it was in anyone else's hands, mm-hmm. and it's one of the best written things ever. So like, one of the greatest magic tricks this crazy German man ever pulled. And to kind of go off your point, Tom, it's really interesting because I would even go, you know, as much as say as you were saying, it's more than a comedy. It's like a buddy movie. It's like a gangster noir, and it's a musical as well. And then on top of all of that, it's very Shakespearean with the mistaken identities and, like, the crazy schemes and the double and Trondre. Like- yeah, that's, that's true. We don't ever think of Shakespearean in terms of his comedies. We just think, oh, tragedies and violence and, you know, idiots, teenagers in love. But, yeah, like, the dude made comedies. He, he, he knew his way around a dick joke or two. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, this movie, in addition to being sort of um, gender-bending, it's definitely genre-bending. Oh, yeah, and the beauty of it, too, uh, with Wilder's script is the fact that when you watch it again, because the the essay inside the Criterion Collection 
talks about how this is one of those movies you know so many of the great movies are ones that it's like oh as you watch it more and more you appreciate it more and more whereas this is one of those ones that you get it when you first see it it just hits you with everything it's got but i push well, back I, 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 I saw it i saw it two months ago and i can yeah. even say like i got it two months ago but e- like even now you just go yeah no this is actually like even better than you remember and i remembered it two months ago the beauty of the script to me is the fact that the more you know watching it again this time and really studying it you realize that you know, the first time, especially when you're watching a comedy, you have such a suspension of disbelief, you kind of just go, especially something farcical, you're kind of just like, I'll go wherever this thing takes me. But the more you watch it, the more you watch it, the more you kind of come to realize that every single thing that could have just been written up to, I don't know, go with it, is sort of explained. That he lays the pa- he lays the tracks for, oh, it's a girl band, no, we're not joining a girl band. He explains why Tony Curtis has got the idea. Why they would witness the massacre. Well, they got to go pick up the car because they've hocked everything and they need to get to this other gig. But even something like that clearly, if you were just coming up with an idea, as we've all had to come up with scripts sometimes, and the idea of like, wouldn't it be funny if they went on the road and dressed up as women? You try and come up with some, you know, goofy explanation for why they keep the clothes on because from a logical standpoint, surely they would just take the train down to Florida as women and then take the clothes off and, and haul ass. But because you introduce sugar on the train... And because both of them, but especially Tony Curtis, falls for her, it gives you the reason why when immediately when they get to the hotel, when Jack Lemon is going, all right, let's just get out of here. Tony Curtis is like, no, 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 we'll stick around for it, but we'll, we'll play this out. Yeah, and I like that Jack, like, it's a me- like immediately Tony Curtis is not in love with her. He's just like, all right, like, let's just not make fucking idiots of ourselves. Let's try to not, like, blow our covers let's just get to florida and then just slowly over the course of that little drinking party they have he does fall for her and like you know like you said you know it's the thing that kind of dooms them because they're so stupid to stay around that long that they manage to stay long enough for the mob party to show up a few weeks later and and, and wilder like, wilder knows how to he knows how much the emo- the audience is going to be invested because the brilliant thing is you initially think the movie is going to set up this dynamic of both Lemon and Curtis want her. They'll, they'll fight over her. They'll compete for her. And they're setting that up on the train ride. But then when they get to Florida and Lemon is walking into the hotel and encounters Joe E. Brown, we're so distracted by that and the humor in that that, oh, there's this man who's now pursuing uh, Daphne, that that takes over and we... We're no longer invested in the, oh, I wonder if Jack Lemon can get Marilyn uh, storyline. We, we're, we're moved past that. He knows exactly how to play a moment and keep you going on a particular path. Like, Xana, you were saying about the genre bend- bending stuff. He knows just how much of the gangster film to give you and just how to get you out of it so that you never feel shocked by the changes, you know? You and, never and feel surprised what? that it stopped being one thing and became another. But- and okay. then we're out of it long enough that when they do come back, we go, oh, fuck, that's right. Yep. These guys, of course they were going to come back. Right. And I don't think, you know, I mean, guess to start, like, I personally hate most comedies. I just, it's just not for me. So the fact that I, you know, find so much joy and think that um, the story was kind of like woven so masterfully with all these genres is just, it still like kind of boggles my mind. You know, it's funny that like, um Cameron Crowe was like a Billy Wilder actor. Oh, yeah. Studied under Billy Wilder. But this I mean, like watching this movie and studying it, like this is very clearly what Bob Zemeckis and and Gale were doing in their yep. career. Like they they literally took every of just like literally laying down every single piece like it's a domino and then just knocking it over and watching it all fall without realizing you're watching the dominoes fall. I mean, there's no like it. I'm like a hundred, like every comedian, every whatever, like every filmmaker is taken from Billy Wilder, but like there's nobody where it's so clear that Billy Wilder was their biggest influence than Robert Zemeckis. And to be honest, I kind of think that's, you know, sidetrack here, but like where Zemeckis has kind of fallen off in like the last 20 or so years is that he's not doing this, the, the, he's not taking his lessons he learned from Billy Wilder. Now, I will say there's one person, one director who did not take from Some Like It Hot that we know for a fact because, and this is the only thing we're going to say about him uh, because we don't want to get into trouble, but I remember in around 2013, 
PBS did that that uh, Woody Allen documentary, right, where they interviewed yeah. him, talked about his life, mm-hmm. and they ended by asking him questions. And I was invested in this; cause it was interesting. And they ended by saying, like, "Well, what's a film that you think is very underrated?" And he named something I don't remember what. And they go, "What's a movie you think is overrated?" And he goes, "Oh, some like it hot. I've never found it funny. I don't think it's funny. I don't get it." And it was genuinely like Tom knows it was akin to my reaction to when Quentin Tarantino says I've outgrown Godard where I immediately looked at my television and wanted to go oh shut up just shut up <laughs> what are you what are you talking about yeah I never well, got it god damn it you know it's uh, like listen I'm not gonna try to cast like oh uh, like I know what he's talking about or like I know his motivations and saying it but it almost kind of feels like Woody tried a lot of silly slapstick farcical movies that just never worked as well as his more like much, I mean, like Andy Hall and Manhattan and whatever. Like he's made funny movies, but like he's never like he, he like did you watch uh, bananas uh, and uh, everything you need to know about sex. But yeah, we're afraid. Yeah, to ask. Like, That's... like he's making like silly, like like because some like it hot could be a silly, silly, stupid movie. Because every movie like this about cross dressing men who have to cross dress because of a situation forcing them to is just doing what this movie did. And they do it worse. So, like, this movie could be silly. And it's it's slapstick. It's far school. There's wordplay. It's like, you could see, like, again, I can't say I know what he's thinking because, uh, here's the joke, I'm not a monster. But um, it almost feels like kind of like, well, I could never crack that code the way, like, Mel Brooks was able to come close to, like, Billy Wilder's silly. I think that there's two types of comedy uh, you know, there is the ones that are the, the much more intellectual highbrow comedy where you can really dissect it and get into it. Uh, you know, and, and some of those films like a Manhattan or an Annie Hall where you can break these things down and be like, well, actually what this means is this. Whereas some like it hot and most of Billy Wilder's comedies, you can't really break them down. And to do so, like on the commentary on the Criterion disc, which comes from a laser disc they did decades ago the guy doing the commentary tries at a certain point to get into the well what is humor the art of the punchline is xyz and you're kind of just like you know how do you ex- it's tough how do you explain humor you know how you can't really it was something that there's nothing to really dig into with it it's just it's it's well it's also good. just i mean for as much as we like it and think it's great well written it, it there it is like a big buy-in you have to really buy in that nobody could look at jack lemon and tony curtis of all people and say oh yeah those are women yeah those well, are women yeah you know what's interesting about that though and i want to give a little uh, acknowledgement of one thing i noticed this time around is that you're right that there is never any attempt made to pass off tony curtis as a woman right from the costuming the wigs the makeup never any attempt the one thing i think is impressive is um the costumes for this one were done by ori kelly who's one of the great uh, costume designers in, in cinema. And what's great about what Ori Kelly does with this, I mean, of course, he did the the, the thing he's most known for with this film is the Marilyn Monroe outfits, particularly that uh, the dress she wears on the yacht with the essentially see-through top. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the uh, I, one of the people in the documentary calls it the boob dress, so we'll call it the boob dress, uh, which is apparently made of an insanely flammable material. But anyway, I give Ori Kelly credit for the fact that with Jack Lemon. The initial outfit we see Lemon in at the train station looks as absurd as uh, as Curtis's, but as the movie progresses, the outfits and the attire of Daphne start to get more and more suited to Lemon as a woman and start to become a little more natural looking so that as Lemon goes deeper and deeper into the Daphne character she starts to look more natural as well. And you start to buy into that a little more, which is a great little thing that they're doing along the way that, you know, that that he becomes more and more immersed in the character and the look matches that, which I think is very, a a very clever, subtle thing in this film. Yeah. I mean, Jack Lemmon's definitely, uh, you know, it, it, it is like, I just love that his character, like throughout the movie, you just keep seeing how, yeah, he gets into character, but he is also, like, so gullible, he even, like, tricks himself into believing something. Like the scene like the scene where he's like, oh, I've been engaged, and Tony Curtis is like, what? You, you can't marry him. And he's, like, literally just not even acknowledging that I am Jack Lemmon, a man, 
engaged to another man, which is, again, not to cast aspersions, but it's 1929. And he seems like there's laws about this. Yeah. You can't marry him. And he's so until he has to grab him by the shoulders and shake and be like, keep repeating to yourself. I am a boy. I am a boy. I am a boy. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am a boy. I am I, like he's so he, like he's so easily led astray. And that's like why you can understand how Tony Curtis still has him as a friend that he's hocking his coat in the winter for on a dog yeah. race. And like he's ruining their lives and that. Jack Lemon's enough of a fucking kind of a goon to still be friends with him because he's kind of easily led astray. He's easily just taken by the nose and just being like, this is what the thing is now. No, and to kind of uh, just go back to that point, too, that's where you can kind of um, you could look at the movie um, with a queer lens. Right. So, yeah. you know, Daphne ends up having this sort of like comedic, but like, you know, kind of substantial in some ways um, love affair with um, Osgood, who is. Um, you know, pursuing her quite relentlessly. And then you have um, Curtis's character who, toward the end of the movie, like, kisses Marilyn Monroe while, like, kind of partly still in drag, right? And, you know, these kind of, like, themes, you know, is what got the movie, like, banned in Kansas because it was, like, inappropriate, right? It was, yeah, oh, yeah. was it banned? Or I think it was labeled adults only? Something like that. It was, there was some it kind was of... banned. It was, like, deemed inappropriate for, like, people in Kansas. Well, because, I mean, I mean, just for the scene at the end where Tony Curtis goes up to Marilyn Monroe after she sings and it's in drag, mm -hmm. people are still assuming he's a woman and he kisses her as much as it's not two women kissing. It's still just like, oh, yeah, like in like it's still kind of the characters are under the assumption two women are making out in front of everybody. And and jumping on that time, you know what I love about that? Sweet Sue, who is not much of a character in the in the film, but, you know, she's she's she has a presence. When Curtis, as Josephine, kisses Sugar, yeah, they cut to Sweet Sue, who is not shocked. Like, they don't give her a shocked face. They don't give her a disgusted face. She immediately just, her eyebrows raise, and she shouts for her assistant, Beanstalk. And yeah. the great thing about her performance in that moment that you come to realize is her response and her attitude and the tone that she shouts for Beanstalk is not a tone of... Uh, oh my god, what are we going to do? It's a tone of, it happened again. Like, there is that sort of implication there from the way that Sweet Sue reacts to that, that, like, this is not the first time this has happened with her all-girl band. Maybe the first time on a stage, but the idea of, like, god damn it, it happened again. Which is great, because the beauty of the film is the fact that, as people point, you know, as, as some people point out, because I think that there's a, a weird especially with a film like this that is so light and so fun, there is this this constant battle, I think, between the schools of analysis where there's some people who go really into analyzing everything and ascribing maybe too much intent to Wilder as a director and other people who kind of go, ah, just leave it alone and just have fun and don't think about it. Like this approach where you either have some people who are going, well, clearly he meant all of these things and, and other ones going, no, there's no way Wilder was thinking about that. There's no way he was thinking about a gay marriage joke or anything like that. But... I think the beauty of what Wilder does with this film is he's clearly aware of the subjects that he's talking about, be it, uh, as he calls it, uh, transvestitism uh, or or uh, homosexuality, uh, you know, and 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 uh, sexual harassment of women and all of these things. He's aware of them, and he's aware of them at a time where we're not really talking about them, uh, you know, as prominently. Uh, we start we're starting to, I should say, as a society. But, you know, not really. And he's kind of going, OK, I know this. I know these things. And most of my audience is aware that homosexuality exists and that sometimes men dress as women and all that. And I'm going to play on that. It's never mocking. It's never taunting or anything like that. It's simply making light of it and letting the audience sort of play in that sandbox for a little bit without ever having to make a statement, which I think is what. What honestly makes the film hold up as well as it does? Because uh, I think that, you know, uh, to touch on the film we were talking about before, and we'll probably have to talk about it again because I think it's in the registry, um, you know, something like Tootsie obviously goes into it, and this is a comedy about how women in the 80s are treated and how men should be better. And the thing with Tootsie is because of that and because it is making a statement about the time and a statement about that, some of it doesn't hold up. You know, some of it feels very dated. With Some Like It Hot, it 
because it's not trying to take a stand on anything or ex you know explore anything, but rather just kind of touch on some ideas, it's still, as Anna was suggesting with viewing the film through a queer lens or, or even just watching it from any kind of angle, it still holds up, you know, well, and it still resonates. It's, it's interesting because this is a movie in the 50s about two guys dressing up as women and there's no jokes at their expense or like the community's expense of, oh, well, people are going to think we're gay if we dress up as women yeah. or I'm not dressing up as a woman because I'm gay. It's like I, Tony Curtis at first, like, I'm not dressing up as a woman. Like nobody's like, that's silly. Nobody's going to believe it. And then when he has to, he's like, all right, well, we're going to do it. So let's stay in character. It's never like, oh, we're we going to look like sissies or we're we going to look like this or that. Or like, oh, those damn gays with their dresses or whatever. It's just like, no, that's just that one offhand comment I mentioned before of just like, you can't be engaged to the rich guy because you're a man. There's laws against this. Well, there's also, there's one joke about it. But the joke works because the joke is at Lemon's expense, which is when they're all packing their bags really quick uh, after the mobs was up in Florida. And he goes, and he goes, well, if we get killed and they put me on the, uh, on the table in the morgue and undress me, I'll die of shame. Which is, that's the closest thing you get in this movie to, like, shame about this. But also, even then, the joke is on the absurdity of Lemon's thought process. Well, because it's also a joke about, again, him being so stupidly in character that he's acting like, oh, well, I'm a woman now, and the doctor's going to see I'm not a woman, and I'm going to be ashamed, which is just like, dude, relax about it. Like, you're on the run from the mob. The, these these actual stone-faced maniacs with machine guns are coming to get you. A, a, a mob boss who can only speak through the, like, radio in his chest. Yes, oh, is, so good. It's just like, yeah, kill these goddamn guys. They keep showing up when we murder many people at a time. Now we're talking about uh, we we've touched on obviously Tony Curtis bit and we've touched on um, on the frequent Wilder collaborator which is uh, which is Jack Lemon but Sandy you mentioned that the thing that initially drew you list was was obviously the presence of the third lead list film the the top build uh, star which is Marilyn Monroe what what is your attitude on Marilyn Monroe in terms of like are you a fan of her film work are you a fan of the icon that is Marilyn Monroe what what draws you to her. I would say it's a combination of it all. And, you know, it's really interesting because in this film, her character in particular, you know, is kind of like this great combination of, you know, super sexy, but also kind of sad and kind of innocent at the same time. And, you know, it pretty much tracks with like her, um, you know, how she's known, was known in Hollywood is kind of like this like vixen, this vamp, like virgin sort of like um, character. And I think, you know, she really brings that to the table in this movie. And it's really fascinating to kind of watch her um, throughout. Because, you know, when she's introduced, um, one of the scenes I just remember so clearly is when she's um, in the train. And then um, I believe Curtis's character um, walks in on her. They they both do initially. Oh, they both do. Gotcha. Because, again, talking about airtight Wilder scripting, you need a reason for them to both run into her in the bathroom. So what happens? Uh, Curtis grabs him and, and grabs Lemon and it fucks up one of his fake breasts. So they have to go in the bathroom <laughs> to fix it up. Right, right. So they go in there and then they see her drinking from her flask, which, you know, she just takes from the little holder on her thigh. And I'm just like, whoa, like that, you know, really sends a message um, to kind of start and kind of have her, you know, as you was said earlier, like, is she going to be just a love interest at these two? Um, guys fight over but then you kind of get to know her story and you you can't help but kind of feel bad for her she's just kind of like you know down on herself she's like i'm not very smart i keep dating um these guys these like saxophone guys who like are no good and i'm always getting like the fuzzy end of the lollipop and you're kind of like oh wow you really want her to meet someone nice um and you know kind of you know end the movie in a happy way which she like does that said it's also interesting that um her character you know had issues rather with the drinking and is kind of like sad and troubled in this way because it really matches how Marilyn, you know, was in real life. And you know what I found incredible about, you know, her filming this movie was that she was dealing with a lot. She was like pregnant. Mm -hmm. As we know, there were a lot of issues with shooting the movie. Like she would come late. It took her, you know, forever to do takes and retakes because she wanted to be like a perfectionist. There were just so many, um, you know, behind the scene troubles, yet you would never get a sense of that from the movie at all. And in fact, you, you mentioned her being pregnant. The The only time where you can notice that she's pregnant in the film is during the first musical number, during Running Wild, 
when <laughs> she's playing the ukulele. Then you notice, especially because at one point she turns to her side at, before it cuts. The other thing that's interesting is any of the promotional photos you see from this film, like any of the promo stills, any of the poster shots or anything that are photographed, are not Marilyn Monroe. If you look up any pictures of, uh, like, you know, they do the promotional shoots, the publicity shoots, and there's all these shots of Marilyn and Tony and, and Jack, and all of those, they actually used one of the other women in the Sweet Sue Band as a body double. And they had her in the outfit because she had the same build as Marilyn, and they just, like, later added Marilyn's face on top. So she, Marilyn Monroe is not actually in any of the publicity shoots that you see from that, which... To, to go on this a little bit, uh, you'll notice that in the publicity photos for this film, uh, which are photographed in color, Curtis and Lemon are in suits. Because Wilder felt that even though color was very common at this point in 1959, it was the way to go, he shot Some Like It Hot in black and white because he felt if you saw Curtis and Lemon in color with the makeup and the wigs and all that, it would break your suspension of disbelief. So, you would just You wouldn't buy it. So it's the Frankenstein thing. It's surprising, but on top of that, if you're curious, and, and especially using as, as a fan of this film, uh, if you can track it down, I highly recommend a movie, uh, just for the, uh, curiosity, called Pepe. Mm -hmm. There's a film called Pepe. Uh, are you familiar at all? I mean, this is going real deep, but uh, there was this movie, the movie that won Best Picture in the 50s called Around the World in 80 Days. Yes, I'm very familiar. Yeah. And the second lead, the lead of it is David Niven, and the second lead is a Mexican comedian called Cantinflas. Mm -hmm. um, so Around the World Navy is a huge hit. They decide they want to make a vehicle for Cantinflas here in America. So they make this other film called Pepe, where Cantinflas' character Pepe comes to Hollywood. The film is generally forgotten, but the one thing that I think is interesting about it is it was shot on a studio lot at the same time as a bunch of other films, including Some Like It a Hot. And at one point, Cantinflas encounters Jack Lemmon in his Some Like It Hot costume. And this film is shot in vibrant Technicolor. So uh, when you're only used to seeing Lemmon in the Daphne outfit in Some Like It Hot, which of course I grew up with this film and, and seeing it in black and white, you do actually get to see what this would have looked like had they shot it in color. And Wilder made the absolute right call because you are so immediately thrown off. You are so immediately looking at this going, that's Jack Lemmon in an outfit just because the color throws it all off. So if you haven't uh, seen that, check. try and hunt that down. To see him in the full costume and color is quite a, a strange experience. Will do, will do. To go back to the Marilyn of it and what Zainab was saying about how she, you know, the character, she like, I think it's, I think what helps work in it, what makes this movie work, you know, the character helps this movie is that, um, is that she is self-aware of her flaws and her issues and it it manages to simultaneously make you go, okay, yeah, I mean, she's kind of the dumb blonde and she's going to be like, she's easily gullible enough to believe these two idiots are women. But it's also like, okay, but she is self-aware enough to know she has problems, which is in and of itself, maybe she's not as dumb as we think. So it adds a more dynamic quality to her character, which, you know, like I said, a lot of things try to do the some like it hot of here's guys dressed as ladies and oh no a woman falls for them and then she's oh no it's like well i don't know it's it's that balance that billy wilder knows that she if she's just dumb and she doesn't get it and she doesn't understand that she's dumb it adds it just adds a bit of a sour taste in your mouth that these two guys are tony curtis in particular are like trying to trick her and I don't know, you know, I think it adds a little bit of that. I, I agree because, you know, that's what to talk about uh, Wild, Billy Wilder's other collaboration with uh, with Marilyn. I think that's what sinks the seven year itch. That's why we remember Some Like It Hot as a classic comedy. We remember the seven year itch for a single shot of Marilyn Monroe on uh, on a subway grate with a dress blown up because the seven year itch is just her playing a one dimensional dumb blonde that came yeah. out before this right yes there's a joke they make he makes fun of it in this Do, what's what's the joke in this one because i might have missed that one. when she's walking to the train a oh, gust yes, of yes. wind blows out yes. and almost blows oh, her dress yeah, up. yeah 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 
Yeah, because it's and and that's Lemon's got the line of like she moves so well. It's like Jello on springs. Uh, there's so many, by the way, uh, in jokes in this in this movie that uh, you know again we're not going to pick up on. There's uh, references to countless old Warner Brothers and old uh, you know gangster films in this for the gangster segments. Um, for example, uh, and I'm just going to cover a couple of movies that I think are fun. Uh, remember when they're all sitting down uh, at dinner for the uh, lovers of Italian opera or what have you? <laughs> and one of his, uh, one of Spatz's henchmen makes some comment, and Spatz picks up a grapefruit and he pulls his arm back, and his you know other henchman grabs him and goes, "Hey, boss, calm down." So for anybody who doesn't know, especially people listening, that's a joke about the famous scene in The Public Enemy, the James Cagney gangster film. Where famously Cagney is talking to his 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 mall, and he gets so mad at her that he picks up a half a grapefruit and smacks it into her face, which was an iconic scene for the time. So that's riffing on that. But the other joke I like a lot more in this because I think it's just so much fun. So when Spatz is walking out, uh, remember they uh, they're they're patting them all down, the the mobsters, and they find the yeah. the gun inside the golf bag and all that, right? Yeah. So. Spatz is leaving that shakedown, and there's some, you know, some hood character flipping a coin and says, good luck on the back nine, Spatz. And Spatz grabs the coin and says, where'd you learn that cheap trick? Does anybody know what the joke of that is? No. The actor who plays Spatz, George Raft, appeared in the original Howard Hawks, uh, I'm sorry, the the original uh, Scarface. Scarface, Shame of a Nation. Ah. And the character he plays in that film is a hoodlum whose bit is that he constantly flips a coin. That's where that cliche comes from, of the gangster sitting there always flipping the coin. It's George Raft. So the entire joke of where'd you learn a cheap trick like that is George Raft is acknowledging that the character is just doing his bit from Scarface. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, for a, for a movie that is fairly surface level and it's, you know, in, in intentionally surface level, there are l- layers that this thing is operating on because Wilder just kept looking for the best gag. Uh, now, to go to your point, I'm talking about Marilyn Monroe and her, her you know, tragedy with this film. The movie is sort of tinged with her own personal life more than any other film she did because unlike Seven Year Itch, which is just very one-dimensional, very one-note, and a, I will say a weird movie to watch now, uh, I don't know. Have either of you guys seen Seven Year Itch? No, not yet. Not yet. Do you guys know what the film's about? No. No clue. Only I am aware of that one famous scene, as you said earlier. Okay, so go get ready. Um, the film is about a guy who wants to cheat on his wife. And the joke of the film is that every summer in New York, all the wives and kids go away. Like they go to the, you know, they go to the grandparents' house in the woods, and the husbands all have to stay home and work. And while the husbands are staying home and working, obviously every single one of them is cheating on their wives. And this film is about this one husband who is determined, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to cheat on my wife. And then Marilyn Monroe moves into the apartment upstairs. And the entire joke is he keeps trying to trick Marilyn Monroe into sleeping with him. Um, Not quite the brilliant airtight film that Some Like It Hot is. Very weird. And the only reason I bring that up is you almost feel as though Wilder is writing Wilder is writing the story of what is life like for the Marilyn Monroe character of Seven Year Itch when she grows up a little and realizes how many people just used her and tossed her aside. Because there's so much more empathy in this oh, yeah. movie toward her, mm-hmm. you know, and especially like having her say, I'm not a great singer, but this isn't a great band. It's because Marilyn Monroe herself thought she was not a very good singer. Um, she thought she was not a good actress, but she wanted to get better. And I, I just think that it's, it's so interesting to see that jump from, you know, just using her as an object in seven year itch to uh, using her in this as a much more empathetic character, but also knowing that while the film has empathy for her, Curtis and to a lesser degree Wyler were really at their wits end with Marilyn during the shoot of this. Yeah, she was apparently um not easy to work with. Well, you you've read Houston's 
book, right? Yeah. Does he talk about his experience with her? Because he worked with her on Asphalt Jungle, start of her career. Yeah, he basically discovered her on Asphalt Jungle. It's like a minor role, but like, you know, yeah. it's Marilyn Monroe. So she stands out and he said, she was great. I thought she was this great actress and blah, blah, blah. Then I saw her career take off. And then I decided I'm going to make a movie with her again. We're going to do The Misfits, Clark Gable, Marilyn Monroe. It's going to be great. And then he's like, the just the decrease in her just mental stability and her, you know, sobriety and all this stuff. He was just like, it was such a sad state of affairs. And, you know, all. I mean... On this movie, I think that's the biggest the, the thing you just keep seeing about, which is that she would routinely not show up to set on time, two or three hours late. She wouldn't leave her dressing room. She could, she, like, I I don't even think barely remember her lines is the right. She like she just didn't remember her lines, and they would tell her, "All right, this is your line," and she'd flub it. Okay, this is your line. She'd flub it. They put it. They put it on like the wall next to her, so she could. It was. Read it off it the was wall. in the. I know what you're referring to. It was in the. So there's the scene where she walks in and she says, "Where's that bottle?" And they put it inside the drawer that she opens. They put and she the forgot what drawer it was. She, she forgot what drawer it was. Yeah. So they had to put it in all of them. The wrong drawer. Yeah, and they had to put it in all of them. Like. Yeah. He really and, struggled here. And then. I mean, though that like final conversation with Tony Curtis at the end, where he's telling her like, "Oh, I'm actually going away." You could see her eyes going side to side because she's reading it off of a blackboard that's off camera because she just she like I, like this is not to disparage the woman, not to say like any negative. She just genuinely could not like do the work without so much coaxing and so much time spent that. You know, you kind of can't blame Billy Wilder for being like, what the fuck? Or even Tony Curtis. Just like, I know Jack Lemmon said he got along fine with her. He's like, I, you know, I I understand she's got, you know, she's got some stage fright issues and she's got all these things. You know, she's she's working hard. She's trying. But, like, you kind of can't help but be like, okay, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, you're a paid actress. This 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 is insane. I wonder, too, how much of that has to do with the fact, you know, the different responses. How much of that has to do with the fact that I wonder if at this point in 59, even though he's already got an Oscar, uh, Tony Curtis was a screen actor and Lemon started out on the stage and he was known for the stage and then he makes Mr. Roberts and wins his Oscar. But I, I do kind of wonder if part of the approach, part of it comes from, you know, Wilder being so much of a, you know, a film technician and Tony Curtis being so much of a film guy and Wilder being a lot more you know, in a theatrical sense, relaxed and sort of just being like, ah, oh, whatever, we're having fun in front of a camera. It's fine. Um, the other thing with, with uh, Monroe, though, is, is that I, I think the real tragedy of it, I mean, there's so many tragedies, the real tragedy of it is this is, even though she was so far gone when she was making this, this is the movie that I feel more than any other she did really proves her critics wrong. I mean, look, I'm not, no one's going to sit and say that Marilyn Monroe had the most, you know, the most range of any actor, but she didn't have to be, uh, you know, have the biggest range. Marilyn Monroe was a movie star, and I don't mean that to be dismissive. I mean that she had a particular lane that she played in better than any other, and I think that this film shows off just how far she can go with characters like this and how much tragedy she can bring to them and how much... Uh, how much depth she can bring to a character well, like this. I mean, this is a movie that is so, like, Swiss clock precise, where everything has to be so right, and even if it took her forever to get it right, she did get it right. Yeah. So, like, it, it, it works. So if, like, you work in this movie, you're, like, you're not horrible. Like, you could, you can do the job, and, like, if you hit these beats, then you're iconic essentially like you, th nobody's going to come away from this movie and be like ah this person they 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 could only do this one thing no this this script you need to bring your a game because like i said this fucking tightrope is just so precarious and so swinging wildly from thing to thing and beat to beat and tone to tone that you're like if you're not if you're not good you're not going to be able to su survive this fucking movie I do think that it says a lot to um, Marilyn Monroe that despite Wilder's frustration with her by the end of things, you know, he praised her performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You hear all, you know, this about how awful filming was and how the two of them clashed and all these things. But at the end of the day, he was like, yeah, she was brilliant. And the other thing is what she should get even more credit for is people write off playing 
the the dumb blonde that she often had to play. People write that off, but especially for a Billy Wilder film, and especially for this film, you need to have such a mastery of comedic timing yeah. because there are so many jokes that have to be done so quick. Like, uh, there's a quick joke that I kind of love, which is her saying, well, I came from a musical family. You know, my mother was a piano teacher. My father, he's he conducts. Oh, where did he conduct? On the Baltimore and Ohio. It's a great, like, quick joke. You know, obviously your dad's a conductor. He's a train conductor. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's a great joke, but you need not only the timing of it, but I think when you're playing a dumb character like that, um, you have to, you have to not only understand the joke, but you have to play it with you understanding the timing, but that the character is completely oblivious to what they're saying, which is a lot harder than, than it sounds, you know? And that's, yeah. I mean, Lemon has to do that too in this film uh, a lot when he has these, you know, where he has to get so lost in Daphne. And he was talking about, uh, in the special he was talking about, how Wilder kind of had to help him a little bit in terms of landing some of the jokes uh, because they're so rapid fire in this film. And you can't, on screen, you can't wait for laughter. Yeah. So there's the one scene where, uh, the, the scene where he's talking about, oh, I'm engaged and all that. And before they shot the scene, uh, Wilder, anticipating the problems, Lemon would have, hands him maracas. And Lemon's like, what am I supposed to do with these? And he's like, just, just take them, just have them. Have him with you in the scene. And Lemon was completely perplexed. He's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do with these. Then they start shooting, and he does the line where he goes, uh, you know, I'm engaged. Who's the lucky girl? Me. Yeah. Da, da, da. And he starts shaking the maracas and doing the song. He realized the reason Wilder did that was because he knew Lemon, especially as a stage actor, wanted to leave a pause between lines to wait for the laugh. Yeah. But if you leave a silence and a pause in a film it's gonna die so instead give him something where he can fill the air but not lose his next line under the sound of the laughter which is just such a case of of wilder being so precise with his comedy and knowing how to give each performer the tools they need whether it's lemon or marilyn whoever to give the performer the tools they need to land the jokes yeah no definitely i mean it, it's it, this movie is too airtight yeah. for anything to be a mistake because it's like all paid off and like it's all set up and then it's paid off and everything just like it's just a clock it like i keep saying it's a swiss watch of just precision every single moment of this movie from the beginning to the end is just hey, maybe they found some shit on the day, like the Maracas thing. But you know what? He worked it in, and it fits in with the rest of the movie. And for giving it a bit of a time, a pause for a joke so the audience can laugh and not miss one of the laugh lines, they're going to still laugh because the Maraca shit is funny. How in how into it he is that he's engaged, he's playing the Maracas. I mean, it's... Uh, Billy Wilder, like, what, what else can we say? The guy, I mean, the guy had one of the careers... And later in life, that makes Quentin Tarantino not want to make films as an old man. But, like, when he was in it, I mean, this dude was fucking, like, untouchable. Yeah. And the other thing, a testament to Wilder's genius, I think. Do you guys know about the first test screening? Um, uh, yeah, something. Uh, yeah, uh, refresh my memory. I'm sure I read about it somewhere. It's, like, on the tip of my so, tongue. So the first test screening, the film kind of bombed. People weren't really laughing. Yeah. Um, maybe you know, and they were wondering, like the student, like, is it because they they think it's a gangster film? They don't know it's a comedy. They don't, you know, uh, X Y Z, you know, what have you. Wilder only made two changes to the film. One isn't even a change to the film. It was just for the test screen. But when he went back, Wilder went in, and he only cut one scene. He cut one scene, which is on the train originally you remember how uh how lemon uh is in bed with uh with marilyn and he says something about i've got a little secret mm -hmm. yeah well there's a, that scene goes on later at one point lemon gets up i think you know to use the restroom or to get a drink or something like that and sugar complains about her bed so she and tony curtis switch beds lemon 
goes into Curtis's bed thinking that it's sugar, right? Or it goes into the bed that sugar was in thinking sugar's still there. And he goes into the bed, takes off his wig and says, remember that surprise? The surprise is I'm a man. And then Tony Curtis pops up and he gets real mad and starts throttling uh, Lemon. And Lemon had said, like, I, I, we thought it was a funny scene. That's the only thing that Wilder cut from the film. And suddenly the entire movie worked better, played like gangbusters, and the audience bought it. And there's nothing about that scene in particular when you describe it that sounds like it's really throwing off the movie. No, you know what? I, 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 like, you, you say that, I'm like, yeah, this, this does throw the movie off. It's, it's, it's just that one little it's thing. It's too just... far. Well, because it, it one it makes Jack Lemon just too stupid. I mean, to just to just, I mean, throw his entire uh, hidden identity out the window and just be like, "Oh, I'm a man. Look at my dick," and just be like, "Okay." It I mean, it's really creepy. Yeah, it's yeah. creepy. It's it it makes him stupid, and then it's just like because there's no other moment in the movie where they're like. Oh, I'm gonna reveal who I am. I'm gonna reveal. It's just like no, like the entire time they don't do it. Like they're very careful to not do it. So this one moment in like, f- like at that point it's like 40 minutes into the movie, and then you have an hour and 20 left where you just go, well, I don't know. He seems a little too stupid now and a little unlikable. Yeah, and and you know, because you don't have the lemon reveal, like you think, then you buy a little more the idea that Tony Curtis will take on a second persona yeah his his carrie grant impersonation shell oil air rather than sound like that um the only other change that they made which i kind of love um iael diamond's widow says it in the features is that uh, typically before one of these test screenings you'd always have the title card that says you know uh a let's say i think it's united artist but united artist major motion picture and to make sure the audience knew that they could laugh Instead, the title card read a United Artist minor motion picture. <laughs> and that was enough to get that quick. And it's not like that's a great gag, but it got a chuckle out of the audience. And because it got a chuckle from them at the start, when they then see the gangsters and they shoot up the coffin and it's all the alcohol leaking out, they now know that's a joke instead of, oh, we're setting up a prohibition drama. Speaking of prohibition, like this movie takes place in 1929. And something that's just really small, but I find so interesting is that the outfits don't quite match the decade, especially when you're looking at Marilyn Monroe's character. Yeah. Even the flappers kind of wore like the loose dresses, but every outfit she wears, like, you know, really hugs her curves. So I think that's just an interesting sort of um, tidbit, given, you know, how airtight the rest of the movie is, how the costuming has um, a little um, fun, I guess, in that sense. Well, it's interesting. It's funny you mentioned that uh, the Criterion disc that they put out for Some Like It Hot. Uh, I keep going back to it because I just I I I'm not gonna lie. Uh, when when you picked this in, I I bought the Criterion just for this episode, and I'm so glad I did. Uh, <laughs> um, they do a there's a documentary on there specifically about Ori Kelly, the costume designer, and uh, the woman who hosts it, um, Deborah Noodleman, uh, Deborah Noodleman Landis, I should point out, which is um, the I believe the spouse of John Landis. I could be wrong on that one. Yeah. So if I'm, yeah, if that's I'm, that's her. Yeah. So she's talking about it, and she makes a, a really interesting point, as you just raised it, about, about the costumes, which is whenever we do period pieces, uh, we're never, th- the costumes are never actually period accurate. We just don't notice that they're not period accurate until years go by. So when we watch, you know, there's always an element of the time they're made. Even she makes the point, the Merchant Ivory films, you know, when those came out in their day, were praised for being so period accurate and now when you watch them you clearly see elements of the 80s in the costume design even though they're period pieces i think you know to that point right now we watch little women the greta gerwig little women and go well of course that's you know that's what they dressed like back then but you can watch the 94 Little Women, you know, the 30s Little Women. You can watch all the different adaptations of Little Women and realize that even though they're all supposed to be in the 1800s, the outfits they're wearing are the 1990s take on the 1800s. And presumably, when we look back on Gerwig's Little Women in 10, 20 years, we'll be like, oh, clearly this was the 2010s. And and you're right, nobody in something like that is actually dressed like they would dress in 1929. Either 
Yeah. I, I, I think it's really just, I mean, a case of like, all right, guys, it's a movie about two guys that dress up as women and nobody notices. Like, we can maybe have a little more stylish fun here than like being some strict for similitude of just oh. realism. Of course, I agree. And I think that's to a point. I think the fact that yeah. Marilyn is, Marilyn's wearing those shaved dresses, but also the costumes, the flapper costumes that um, Josephine and, and Daphne are wearing are over-exaggerated. I mean, the collar that they have, um, uh, Josephine, and that kind of stuff is so uh, over-exaggerated to, to a point. Now, I do want to touch on some other things here, of course, because uh, there's one person... Well, real quick, do you... Uh, Zainab, do you happen to know... Because I already t- I mentioned this to Tom off mic, but do you happen to know who uh, Billy Wilder originally wanted for the roles in the film? I do remember, but her name is slipping my head right now. Yes. So Mitzi Gaynor is who he wanted for the Marilyn yeah. Monroe role, mm-hmm. which I think you lose something there. But do you know who he always wanted Lemon? But the studio told him Jack Lemon is not a big enough name to open this movie. You have to put somebody else opposite Tony Curtis. Do you know who the studio wanted him to put in the lemon role? Who did he want to put in the lemon role? Well, it was the studio told him, we don't want lemon. We want it to be Frank Sinatra. That would have been a totally different movie. Would have been a terrible movie. (laughs) Would have been. And I like Frank Sinatra as an actor. There's no. What an awful choice. What a truly terrible choice. There is no world where that works. Not at all. In any way, shape or form. Because you know there's the beauty of Lemon's character is that you have to believe that he is fully embracing being treated as a woman, and there's no way well, that Frank Sinatra would do that. He would play it too absurd. And I, I saw um, a quote from Tony Curtis where somebody asked him, saying like, oh, so watching the movie, it seems that you're doing a much better job at being feminine than Jack Lemon is. And Tony Curtis laughs and goes, uh, well, yeah, that's because I was really embarrassed and wasn't very like excited to be dressing up as a woman and playing as a woman. So I was very meek and shy. Whereas Jack Lemon was excited as hell to be doing this. And he'd come out of the dressing room like a, like a bat out of hell, excited, <laughs> like, excited to do it. So he had no shame. And so he comes off feeling more masculine because we tend to think women are meek and shy and quiet and if you're loud and obnoxious that's a masculine trait he goes which is funnily enough you know i mean pretty thematically you know yeah on point for this movie which um to you know i'm to go back to your point about Marilyn before about how this almost feels like him sequelizing her, her character from seven year itch it 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 almost does feel like he billy wilder learned something from that movie and was like okay um maybe i didn't explore the interiority of the female of female's life just the way it needed to be so i'm going to make a movie where at least jack lemon does comes to understand the difficulties at which women have to live in this world because there's more stuff with him like complaining about the clothes they wear, the shoes they wear, how do they walk in these things? Oh, it seems like all the men are being lecherous towards him and he's kind of got to learn how to not, you know, he's the one who kind of learns that, yeah, it kind of sucks being a woman in this shitty man's world, which, and, you know, it feels, you know, Billy Wilder's kind of saying, all right, maybe I was kind of shitty to women in movies or whatever or something, like an apology of yeah. some sort. And yet it's funny you say that because that makes me think, like I Im- Im- originally thought like, oh, but he went on to write so many great female characters. But in fact, you know, even that's not necessarily the case because do you know what movies he makes before the seven year itch? Double Indemnity, Sunset Boulevard, and Sabrina. And Ace in the Hole. Well, Ace in the Hole, there's no, there's like no women. I mean, there's a woman. And then I like Sunset Boulevard. Okay, fine. He he makes a woman. That's crazy. That's the point of the movie. Fine. But like, yeah, there's the, he, he wasn't writing the most in, uh, rich interiors, interior lives of women before. They were very much manly movies, men's men movies. I mean, I don't know. He's, he, he wasn't John Huston, but he was definitely, uh, he definitely had a, a lens that he decided to purposefully shed for this movie. Yeah, I mean, you do have, I, I will say, in fact, he does have some, he does still give some good lines to the one female character in uh, Ace in the Hole. But I, I agree with you overall. Well, he can't not give good lines to anybody. That's just what he does. He just, he sneezes and hears a good line. 
Can we single out the other performance that I think needs to be addressed? Joey Brown. I mean, unbelievable. Just right out of the gate, he's 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 fucking killing it. He's he's like a cartoon character. He like he looks like like a Looney. He was drawn in a Looney Tune. Right down to his facial expressions, he was just giving so much. It was just so like delightful to see him on screen every time. And it's funny because he he was a big star at a you know in the. 30s and 40s his he was appearing in above the you know above the title uh starring in a number of comedies in in you know in the past uh so he's coming into this thing we don't really get that but he's coming into this thing as a you know for the audience at the time going oh look at him i remember him yeah i mean this performance is so great because if it's like 10% less funny and charming, you realize, oh, this guy's just a fucking creep. Yeah. Like, he's just a weird little man who's kind of a creep. Just like, nonstop not letting this, to his mind, woman say no. He's go- He literally takes, he doesn't take no for an answer the yeah. entire movie. Lit- I mean, the movie literally ends with him comedically not taking no for an answer. And it's you know, and I think it's it's the way he delivers the the fact that he has these little inhales so before each, these little inhales before each line where it's always just but mother wouldn't approve. But this, he's so joyful. He's, so he's like a li- he's like a little kid. He's just a little kid having all the fun in the world. So he's so, like you. There's not a mean bone in this weird little man's body. So it's less creepy and less problematic because oh he's 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 just a big nice idiot man. He's just a big child. I'm so curious what I have not seen any of the movies uh, where Joe E. Brown is the lead. I wanted to seek them out before this recording, um, but then uh, the past three days have been a nightmare uh, of uncertainty and chaos, so I didn't get a chance. I do have a movie. This is going to be fun. I'm going to pull this back in. Uh, Kyle, get the bell ready. I do own another movie that Joe E. Brown is in, though. Oh, fuck's sake. The 1929 Warner Brothers film called On With The Show where Joe E. Brown uh, plays one of the actors in the show opposite, that's right, Arthur Lake. I brought it back. I Jesus brought him Christ. in again. I, I, for clarification, he, Arthur Lake is a, a very forgotten comedy star from the 20s and thir- uh, 30s and 40s who I've become obsessed with, despite truly no one uh, recalling him. But Joey Brown is, is fantastic. Uh, should, we, should we talk about the ending? I mean, yeah, let's go. Yeah, for it. Absolutely. Let's talk about the end because the ending is just it. it, it one, I, I believe the American film is one of the best lines in film. And apparently what I love is that Wilder didn't originally like the ending. Right. He didn't. It was actually a placeholder until, you know, he found something else that he felt um, was better, but never found it. So the line stuck. And now it's like infamous. Yeah. It's, it's so great. Because what what's great about the ending of this film, that you have them running off together, you do that sort of... I, I guess the beauty of it is, you know, you, you mentioned Shakespeare before, uh, Zainab, and, and it's true that Shakespeare's comedies always kind of end with that to invoke a title, all's well that ends well kind of vibe, you know, where everybody, you know, everybody winds up falling in love, right? Right. Uh, everybody, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> you... you every one of them could essentially end with Puck coming out and saying, if we shadows have offended and all that. What's beautiful about this is that the film kind of does that and doesn't because it does have Curtis and uh, Monroe kissing and finding each other and you have them boating off into the sunset. So you do get your happy ending conclusion, but also it, it doesn't resolve itself insofar as like Tony Curtis doesn't suddenly become a millionaire and he's like, all our problems are solved. He's saying to her, he's like, I'm the kind of guy you don't want to wind up with. You keep saying you don't want to wind up with it. And she's just saying, yes, go on, go on, go on. And then you pan up to Joey Brown and uh, and Jack Lemon, And Lemon is doing everything he can to turn Osgood away. Uh, you know, I, I, I smoke all the time. I lived with a saxophone player. I can never have children. You know, we can adopt some. And then, of course, uh, he pulls off the wig and goes, ah, well, I'm a man. And, well, nobody's perfect. And you get Lemon giving that odd confused look the end comes across the screen and apparently the audience died at that and what's great is that it's an ending where the story is resolved but also suggests that you could do an entire fourth act 
of how how is Lemon going to get out of this marriage? What are Monroe and Curtis going to do? That seems just as fun. Well, also, the mob is still after them. Yes, also true. Because, <laughs> because, because they've now witnessed a second mass murder. They are still on the run. Tony Curtis is now got this woman who is probably going to be a lot of trouble because she just seems to invite trouble into her life when she dates these idiot saxophone players. And now Jack Lemon has this horny little dog on his leg that won't <laughs> stop humping. Now, now I want to ask this before we get into like Oscars and stuff like that, which is always how we wrap it up. I'm going to ask this, especially with this film, because Tom, you've now seen it twice in a year. Uh, Zainab, you said you've watched this a number of times. I want to ask Zainab, what is the one bit in this movie that always gets you, no matter how many times you see it? What's the one scene or gag or line that always gets you? I would say for me, for me, the one scene, oh my goodness, there's so many. It feels like a trick question. That's Actually, what this show's all about. It's all the gotcha questions, like what scene is funny? <laughs> we're trying to make you look very bad in public by saying, oh, hey, some like it hot's too funny to boil it down to no. once. Oh, okay, okay, I decided, <laughs> right. Right. My scene, I think I just genuinely love the train scene of how chaotic it gets when they're all squeezing into the cart and they're all drinking, they're all talking. It's kind of like also really um, fun scene because it's kind of like, um, you know, Jack Lemon and Tony Curtis's characters like being kind of embraced into like the womanhood of, you know, the sisterhood of the traveling pants sort of um, scene. So I think that's the one for me. Tom, what about you? What's the scene that always gets you? I mean, I, you know, I wanted, I, there's just one, it's not even a scene. It's just this one moment and it's not, you know, it's maybe not the best scene or my favorite scene or whatever, but I just, I just love it so much because it's the one scene that's so, that makes me laugh so much. That's got none of the Billy Wilder dialogue. It's in the, it's in the, uh, the speakeasy when they're arguing about money and then they see the cop and then they just, they both just look at each other. And then just get up and leave. Yep. yep. That's and it. That's I'm, I'm just like, that's, that's, I mean, it's perfect. And ju it just makes me so laugh that they're just like, all right, fuck this. Let's get out of here. <laughs> I feel like, I, I feel like to me, I mean, like I, I, I saw this movie for the first time when I was uh, young. I think it was maybe like 10 or 11. Did and... your dad make fun of you saying, you haven't seen this? <laughs> <laughs> that's my, that's my, that is my Joker origin story is, is, uh, for Zainab to, to know, uh, my whole reason I became obsessed with movies, I, I bring up a lot, is that, uh, you know, my parents watched a lot of classics, but there was, I think it was like eight years old, and I made a reference to, the Animaniacs made a reference to Citizen Kane, so I brought it up to my dad, and I went, oh, what's Citizen Kane? And he just went, you haven't seen Citizen Kane? And I always go back to, like, I was eight. You would know <laughs> if I had. I can't operate the VCR. But so I, I always say that's kind of my origin story for like why I got so upset with the movies. I just never wanted to feel that again. Where somebody goes, you've never seen blank. So, I, but I watched something like it when I was young, and I immediately my takeaway from this movie was Lemon. I loved Jack Lemon. I I wanted to watch everything Jack Lemon did. I thought he was so funny. I thought he was so good. And when I was doing uh, middle school and high school theater, I always tried to do Jack Lemon's delivery. So for some reason, it's the thing that always gets me. Is it's I, I shouldn't say this one thing. It is this one and it's terrible on an audio medium to say it this way, but this one particular face that Jack Lemon makes, which is he does it a couple times. Uh, the way he purses his lips and squints his eyes, he does it during the tango with Joey Brown when he's really getting into it. But there's also the moment uh, Sweet Sue is telling them, well, I don't want any men on the train. He's doing, oh, man, I wouldn't be caught dead with men. Oh, they're all hairy beasts uh, with, with eight hands. And they only want one thing from a girl. And he just does the same pout. And it breaks me every time. I don't know what it is about his weird elastic face, but it's it's so good. I it just what the first time we see them in the dresses and they're walking down the train. It's so funny that. Tony Curtis's character is taking it so much more seriously and he's like doing the walk and he's got like the face where he's oh this is how a woman's supposed to look and walk and Jack Lemmon's just like stumbling around like a big idiot goon and, <laughs> but, and then just as the movie goes on Tony Curtis is tr like pretty much like not caring let mo more and more just pretty much putting his Cary Grant performance ahead of his woman performance and Jack Lemmon just keeps getting in deeper into character he's pulling some Daniel Day Lewis shit back in 1929 <laughs> it's, just, I don't know, it's, it's just so funny watching to, especially because it's so funny knowing he like they literally needed to get a different voice for tony curtis 
like it's it's never not funny just it, it, it feels like to me it adds another joke to it of just like yeah this is silly this is another person's voice yeah don't overthink this shit well and, and speaking of not overthinking i mean you know to talk about him as uh when he becomes shell oil when the only time this movie breaks logic it's normally very airtight right like we said there's always a reason for something to happen there's always some grounding reality it only breaks that rule once and when it does that it's such a killer joke which is uh when lemon sees marilyn with with shell oil and she's like oh well let's go back and tell josephine and somehow there's no way it could have happened but somehow Tony Curtis makes it back before them and is in the tub. Yeah, I love like, that. It's, I love that shot of him when Marilyn Lee is slowly getting up and yes. he's still in the outfit and he's just like, "I'm gonna fucking kill you." <laughs> well, especially because speaking of how smart Wilder is, the fact that you could have just shot that scene, you know, straightforward and had it stay in that shot, sort of from you know lemons over the shoulder, but the fact that Wilder, uh, for for the beginning of the scene. Rem- uh, when Tony Curtis is getting out of the tub, he literally removes one of the walls from the set to yeah. shoot him from behind in the bathtub, which, uh, you know, uh, makes no logical sense, like if you're thinking about the geography of the room, but does it just so you can get the slow reveal of the back of the coat and then the full reveal of the, the jacket and pants with the suds on it? It's such a good moment, such a good visual. Hey, guys, this is a good movie. What can what <laughs> we tell you? I mean... It, I think it, it's kind of weird because it feels like this is the first movie we've done in this show so far where it's not like immediately apparent why it should be in the film registry, in, at least in the first year, because there's no like historical import. It wasn't the first movie made by a black man like uh, the, the Learning, Learning Tree, Tree was or, you know, like it was the first horror movie or whatever. It's the first sound. blah blah. blah. It's just like it's just so perfectly crafted. Yeah. That you have to go, yeah, no, I mean, it, it it influenced everybody that came after it, and it didn't, you know, like, it didn't introduce a new technique or a new this or a new that. It's just, it's just perfect. I want to pose a question to you guys. Sure. One question. I would say that one criticism that I've seen about the film in general is that it's too long. And in rewatching it, I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's longer than what I thought it was when I was a kid. What do you guys think about the length? Too long? It, it It's, it's maybe a little too long because for the most part i don't think a comedy needs to be two hours long any longer than two hours i mean i mean i'd have to literally sit down in front of it on like a moviola or final cut or whatever to see like well fuck what could i like how could i trim this even a little bit to like get it down shorter but i mean it it maybe doesn't feel long i mean like it moves but it is also a case of like oh holy shit a lot's happened i I, I definitely disagree with that, I have to say. Like, that's such a... Like, to me, if I'm going to criticize a movie for being too long, I need to follow that up with the criticism of, I think it's too long, here's what I would cut. Because if I can't name something to cut, then, like, for example, I just yesterday, I um in what can only be described as an act of self-harm, I watched all three Hobbit movies. Oh, Wow. I I needed something while I doom refreshed the New York Times vote count. Um, so I watched all three Hobbit movies. And that's a thing you look at and go, they don't need to be this long and immediately go like, this could go, this could go, this could go. We don't need this. We don't need Legolas. We don't need this. We don't need that. But then... You well, we always need Legolas. I'm going to argue with you right there. I'm going to speak for the world and say, uh, you never need more Orlando Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, so, but like, you can look at that and say what to cut to me. I, and this was the thing I always had, cause I'm always bothered by, I think film school ruined me on, uh, talks about runtime, like especially rules about runtime, because I remember, you know, your, uh, you know, professors in film school, uh, Tom can attest would tell us things like, well, a short film should really, the ideal runtime should be 10 minutes or, uh, well, if you're going to do this, the ideal runtime should be this. And the best professors we had were the ones who would tell you like, the film should be exactly as long as it needs to be. Oh well, yeah, no, I mean, and, that's and so, the case. so when I look at something like *Some Like It Hot*, I feel like it is a, it is, as Tom pointed out, it's a magic trick that shouldn't work because every moment in it pays off. Even little things. What, what, what? what I mean, you know, even if you cut 
Uh, if you cut Tony Curtis talking to the secretary, you don't know why they're going to the car. You don't have that set up. Even if you cut little moments in there of him making, you know, oh, well, I, I was uh, I was his blood donor, type O, and then uh, blood type O shows up like three more times in the film. There's so many little gags that pay off that I think uh, to say that it's too long is almost like saying there's too many cards in this house of cards. Let's pull one or two. You know, it's well, so carefully I structured. Said, I mean, I can't, I like, I, I mean, I don't know if it's too long. I mean, I'd have to literally sit down and be like, all right, well, let's see. What can we do here? I don't think we can because it's kind of pretty well constructed, but I don't know. Let's, let's get into this thing, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. But yeah. I, I, I mean, it, you just, you just, you do with comedies feel length more than other movies. Yeah. Do. I think it's, I think it's a, it, it, it's, it, much like the train that it's partially set on, it's always going somewhere. And to me, as long as you're going somewhere, um, I'm on board. So uh, we always wrap up talking about the Oscars because I always find that an interesting way to gauge how these films were seen in their time. Uh, you know, at this point, Billy Wilder had already had, so just to be clear, because sometimes we have a case where when we look at the Oscar reception, it's like, well, they didn't appreciate him as a filmmaker at the time. At this point, Billy Wilder already had gotten a Best Picture nomination for Double Indemnity. He had already won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival and won Best Picture for The Lost Weekend and got a Best Picture nomination for Sunset Boulevard. So it's not as though the Oscars were opposed to recognizing him. However, Some Like It Hot did not receive a Best Picture nomination that year, which if you watch the uh, special features on the Criterion does seem like several people involved in this film were annoyed about that. It did receive um, six other Oscar nods. It though, did. Right? And it won for um, Best Costume. Correct. So what we have here is we've got the Best Picture nominees that year were Anatomy of a Murder, The Diary of Anne Frank, The Nun Story, Room at the Top, and the winner, which was Ben-Hur. Now, of course, because Ben-Hur was nominated that year and Ben-Hur, Ben-Hur was the epic, of course it was going to walk away with a lot of things. Uh, that's almost like sitting down and going, if you sit down and go, why didn't Goodwill Hunting or LA Confidential win more Oscars? And you go, oh, it was the Titanic year. But you are right. It was nominated for a number of other things. Uh, Billy Wilder did get nominated for Best Director, uh, but lost to Ben-Hur. Jack Lemmon, uh, was nominated for Best Actor, but lost to Charlton Heston for, again, Ben-Hur. Uh, it was nominated for Best Screenplay based on material from another source because Some Like It Hot is based on a 1935 French film called Fanfare of Love. Uh, but it lost that category to Room at the Top. It was nominated for Best Art Direction Black and White, which it lost to The Diary of Anne Frank. Best Cinematography Black and White, which it lost to The Diary of Anne Frank. And Best Costume Design Black and White, which, as you noted, it won. I always try and watch these films before we record so I can get a sense for myself of well, out of these nominees, would uh, would I have nominated it? And I just want to take a moment to say, uh, Anatomy of a Murder is great, and Anatomy of a Murder rules. To talk about movies that deal with sexuality at the time, you know, Some Like It Hot is dealing with cross dressing and homosexuality, and then you watch Anatomy of a Murder and realize that that same year, people are going to the theater and watching a movie that is explicitly discussing sexual assault. For, I mean, I don't. Have you ever seen Anatomy of a Murder, Zainab? I haven't. It's, I mean, it's a remarkable film. It's, I highly recommend J- uh, Jimmy Stewart courtroom drama, but really surprising the things that they get away with saying uh, in 59. But then you have Room at the Top, which is a starring drama. I really like Ben-Hur. The Diary of Anne Frank is uh, an interesting film, uh, particularly because, uh, as I noted to Tom, when I was, before I watched it, I saw the notes like, oh, Diary of Anne Frank was nominated for this many things, and it got a Best Supporting Actor nomination for Ed Wynn, which I don't know if you're familiar with Ed Wynn. You've probably seen him in Mary Poppins, things like that. He's the old character actor who always had the silly voice and talked like this. <laughs> so I was very concerned as to what he was doing in that movie, because holy cow. Uh, like I said to Tom, it was, hearing him in that is almost like when you watch the uh, Sidney Poitier, A Raisin in the Sun, and the voice of Piglet is the one who throws them out of the neighborhood. Yeah, that is the mental picture I'm like stirring in my mind. It's really, because he, he has the same voice, so you're just sitting there. And so, I mean, he oh, looks like Piglet. Yeah. So you really just, like, you keep thinking he's going to follow up. It's like, we just don't uh, want any of your kind around here, Pooh. Like, it's very weird. But I will just say, in any year, some like it, how should be a Best Picture nominee. But particularly in a year where The Nun Story, one of the most interminable Best Picture nominees I've ever watched, is nominated. Some like it, how absolutely deserved uh, more recognition than it got. 
Uh, but this was a big year. I mean, you know, it's also that same year, 59, the 400 Blows and Wild Strawberries both get original screenplay nominations. So it is a year where you start to see things changing. A lot of people have cited this film and the way that it brings up these taboo topics as one of the movies that finally killed the Hayes Code. And I think that oh, yeah. 1959 in general, Anatomy of a Murder helps kill the Hayes Code. This, you're looking at the introduction of 400 Blows and Wild Strawberries. And even Ben-Hur, um, Ben-Hur is riddled with homosexual subtext that they just kept away from Charlton Heston. Mm-hmm. That's that they that the director and and the the other actor knew like oh you two used to be lovers just don't tell Charles but it is it is worth noting that of course the film's reception uh, since has has been great I mean it was uh, the number one comedy film selected by the American Film Institute for their 100 Years 100 Laughs poll in 2000 and selected as the best comedy of all time by the BBC in 2017 so of course its reception has only grown um, you can you would be hard pressed to find anybody besides Woody Allen who doesn't find this film funny. It's its legacy has, has only grown over the years. Zainab, thank you so much for joining us for this. I, I, I really appreciate it. And I, I, you are, you are certainly welcome back anytime. Uh, uh, hopefully with a, uh, I think we can admit now, uh, there was a little bit of, of, uh, bargaining that went on with this episode. Can I acknowledge that? Yes, you can. <laughs> that you had, uh, cause we now have a guest book for it. So I can feel comfortable addressing this. Um, you, I had sent you the list of films, and you went. My number one, some like it hot. My number two would probably be Intolerance, the D.W. Griffith film. And we had had so much trouble booking guests for Intolerance that we were like, oh, oh my god. I was like, hey, would you want to do that? That would be really great. And uh, I, I'm I was thinking, God, I would do anything, anything to get a guest on for Intolerance. I would do oh, I, whatever it takes. And you said I'll do it under one condition. And I said anything, absolutely anything. And you said. Um, you have to get your significant other to try this one particular food she doesn't want to try. And immediately I went, <laughs> well, I give up. I give up. That's, nope, I can't do it. Physically, it will be impossible. Just, we'll, we'll do this one. Uh, <laughs> but it worked out for the best because uh, I, I'm really glad you came on for this one. I'm really glad to have an opportunity to talk about this one. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was fun. I hope I'll be back soon. To wrap up like we usually do, what films would you guys include in the registry? A reminder that it must be an American film and be at least 10 years old. So for me, you know, sometimes I have to do a lot of explaining uh, for mine, and there's usually some tangential connection, but for this, I think it's it's really obvious, uh, not just because of Sharing a Star, but I truly love this movie uh, to death, and I think it doesn't get enough respect. Of course, Some Like It Hot is the most revered uh marilyn monroe film but to me the quintessential marilyn monroe movie that really gets to the heart of what people admire about her both as a performer and as an icon sure you have the one shot in seven year itch but nobody really talks about seven year itch to me it came out about six years before something like it hot it's the 1953 howard hawks musical gentlemen prefer blondes uh i adore gentlemen prefer blondes marilyn is exceptional in it but you also have great performances by Charles Coburn and particularly Jane Russell. Jane Russell is amazing in this film. They are both so good. The movie is very funny. It's so much fun. The music is great in this film. Uh, it's just a, an absolute delight. You know, the, there's this great number with Jane Russell uh, dancing in a, in a gym with all these muscular men uh, flexing, which is uh, probably way more homoerotic than anything else could be in 1953. Um, it's, it's brilliant. It's great. Hoagie Carmichael did some of the music. Uh, Jack Cole's choreography is great. And of course, the thing that Gentleman for Blondes is best known for is also the thing that Marilyn Monroe is probably best known for, which is Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. Uh, and that incredible sequence of her in the pink dress with the diamonds. I mean, that has been copied so many times. Right, I mean that has been riffed on by Madonna in in Material Girl. That's been riffed on by Beyonce and Ariana Grande and uh, James Franco wore the dress on the Oscars. Uh, Nicole Kidman does it in in Moulin Rouge. It's an iconic scene, and and just for that scene alone, it, it should be in the registry. The same way that the actual singing in the rain sequence, the singing in the rain, is iconic. But much like singing in the rain, the film around the sequence is also so much fun. 
it's it's such a great classic technical and musical i i adore gentlemen for blondes and it's crazy to me that that's not in the registry already i don't know i mean for me it kind of came to me pretty quickly it's not obvious i mentioned in the episode how this movie should not work it is pretty insane it's pretty wild and if it was made with like one percent less less of a deft touch it would be like a train wreck. It would be just a laughable, just nonsense that d- didn't age well. And there is one movie that I grew up with, a very well-loved, iconic comedy, that I'm kind of surprised isn't in the film registry, but, you know, whatever, sometimes things take a while, that is kind of the same, where I you look at it critically, you try to put your mind to it and go, okay, This is nonsense. This shouldn't work. I don't know why it works, but it is somehow one of the most watchable movies you'll ever see. It's hilarious. It's just, it's just one of a kind. It's the Blues Brothers. I gen, like, I, it's like some, like, like you just watch the Blues Brothers and you go, how is this good? Like, you can explain it to somebody. Like, you'll even think about it after watching it, and you'll think about scenes, and you just go, why does this work? What, how does this even work? Like, you, you, it just, it's this weird magic trick that can't be replicated. And then you even see the same filmmaker try to replicate it in a sequel, and it is trash. It is a trash fire. I, like, it's just this bizarre, magical, wonderful, weird little thing that even is like, yeah, it's funny, but... It's weirdly funny in that, like, you, like, are there jokes really even in this thing? It's more like kind of an action comedy musical. It's more like action and musical than comedy, but you still find yourself just having a great time. And you're like, yeah, that was funny. And you go, wait, was it? Did I laugh? It, it's like, it's the most bizarre fucking movie in the world. Like, because you even watch the, the other SNL guys making movies at the time, like, you know, Vacation or Ghostbusters or whatever, or Animal House, and you just go, yeah, I get this. This is funny. This is like, you get it. There's punchlines, there's setups, there's jokes. It's simple. I get it. There's something here. The Blues Brothers is bizarre. I don't get it. I love it with all my stupid, stupid heart. And I think it should be in the film registry. I think it's one of the great film comedies of all time. It's one of a kind. It's unique. It's you know, as much as this filmmaker may be controversial, it's, I mean, it's pretty damn well made by Landis. Landis went on a hell of a run and it's just, it's, it's, it's a magic trick that's not too dissimilar in terms of being out of its mind, one of a kind, unique nonsense, like some like it hot. I fully, I fully agree with that. I fully endorse it because the other thing with Blues Brothers uh, that I think makes its case for the registry is, is that you also get to preserve some of the some music perform- yeah performances by some of the greatest musicians to get it's to- just a celebration of music that was dead at the time i mean ray, ray charles aretha franklin cab calloway yeah it helps without even being a documentary of just you know solid of like keeping that era of music relevant not relevant but you know it's it's now a part of like the registry a record like this thing existed and it was important Thank you for listening, and thanks to Zine Bakande for joining us. You can follow her on Twitter at Akande Z. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media as well. You can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at Raging Bull 1990. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone who you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, Tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time.